internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. Tonight, I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me tonight are... Joe. David. Welcome, Dave. Well, we'll start off. What are you guys drinking tonight? I am going to drink a combination of Hoptronics and Smash Galaxy, because those were the last two beers in my refrigerator. I am naturally a uh, whiskey guy. I know I'm, I'm against the grain for the podcast, but uh, I'm doing a Jameson cask mate, which is quite tasty. Ooh, what is that? So they actually, um, uh, the cask they use are a beer cask instead of um, fresh cask. So it makes it, it gives it a nice little sweeter taste to the, the, the Irish whiskey that I really like. Is it right between a bourbon and an Irish whiskey, which I like a lot. Interesting. Yeah, I'll try that out. See, everyone tells me that whiskey tastes different. If I drink different whiskeys, it will taste different, and it all just tastes like terrible to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, they, they all have a different taste to it, and I'll, I'll give you a funny little side on, note on that. I once did a trip around Ireland where the entire purpose was to hit every single distillery. Oh, wow. And I uh, rented a car there, drove the entire uh, island, and hit every distillery. And then about half, and it was about halfway through the trip, met up with this group of people that were partying at the campgrounds, and we drank our way through my entire collection that I was going to bring back with me. So I then had to <laughs> quickly drive back around the island and get all the whiskeys again before I came home. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm okay with that. Nice. For a second, I thought you were going to say, and I got to the end of the island, and I decided they all tasted the same. <laughs> <laughs> and if you, if you get into the whiskey, guys, oh my god, between you know the scotch, the whiskeys, and the bourbons, everyone has a strong opinion on them. I'm like, yes. Eh. Uh, if you ever drink with Claudio from Lulzbot, he is a huge yes. whiskey guy. And he will, like, talk your ear off about the different flavor profiles and everything. And every time we've gone out, I'm just like, it all tastes like whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> they all get you drunk and, you know, not as many calories. That is true. Yeah. That is true. I'm starting to notice those. Uh, <laughs> I am on the second to last bottle of the Netcon 99 from Three Floyds. Oh, nice. I'm starting to run low on my uh, Three Floyds haul. From a couple months ago. Yeah, apparently Steve's got some Three Floyds for me at his house. I need to meet up with him and get it. Uh, I think we only have one new segment, which is Debian uh, 10 got released over the weekend. Yay, new Debian. It's always exciting when a new Debian comes out. Debian 9's only been out for, what, four and a half years? Five years? And it still feels new every time I install it. <laughs> yeah, Debian's like the base Linux distro that... Ubuntu is based off of, then all of their distros are based off of. So it's always exciting when the very foundation of all your favorite distros gets an update. Yeah. Yeah. One of these days we'll like talk about Fedora and those redheaded stepchild distros. But, you know, until we're about then. to start playing with that. We've, Why? We've got a. <laughs> what? <laughs> Some people like to suffer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, at work, uh, I'm starting to, I'm just, I'm just going to ignore that I spilled half my beer and tripped my, uh, my GFCI outlet. Is that what happened? Is that why your lights went out? All of a sudden, yes. Aaron's lights went out on his webcam feed and he just looks so shocked. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was just going for mood lighting. <laughs> yep. So, uh, we're going to have a quick pause. Well, I figure my life out. We we went through like half of our beers while we were talking to Dave and trying to get him primed for the show. While we're waiting for Aaron to figure out what happened to his electricity, Dave, why don't you introduce yourself? Well, I'm uh, Dave Randolph, and I am the CEO of Printed Solid uh, over here in uh, Newark, Delaware. And we, you know, we sell all the fun stuff for the 3D printers and all that. And we try really hard to be the open source advocates for uh, 3d printing as well so we try to encourage as much as we possibly can our own internal filament is open source the jesse filament we're very proud of that 
we try to carry as many open source, you know, products and companies and stuff like that and represent them uh, in order to encourage it as options for people. Um, yeah. there's, there's a lot of closed source products in the 3d printing world that keep coming to light and we really want to try and be that company that's, you know, hold, holding it up as best we can. Uh, a few years ago, it was, it was almost like 3d printer component companies were a dime a dozen. And then they just started dying off and we saw lots of filament companies and 3D printer machine companies come about. But it, it became kind of almost kind of hard to buy components if you weren't just buying directly from AliExpress, which I hate doing. So as you guys bring on more and more component level pieces, it makes me really excited for the future of RepRap. It feels like you guys are trying to bring that world back. We're trying really hard, and uh, to be honest with you, the hardest part of that is sorting through all of that crap on the AliExpresses and all of that. Yeah. My rejects pile is huge in the shop, and it, it, it kills me every time because I sit there and I go, okay, you know, the AliExpress, somebody there has got to make a decent bearing, and I've just got piles upon par- piles of just junk bearings. Yeah, and I'm trying to find every component and try to be the place where they go. Oh, I can go here and I can get all that random stuff at one place, but but know that it's not going to be junk. Yeah, and for a decent price, still, like you guys are you're carrying quality components and quality components for a price that's not going to like kill the average rep wrapper, which is just phenomenal. That that that's the challenge. That's the yeah. challenge. Try and weigh the difference, you know, between that. There's a reason why you're not going to find, you know, the the cheap clone knockoff board controllers or the cheap extruders for the cheap hot ends. But you're not going to also find me carrying the eight thousand dollar, you know, pellet extruders. Uh, so try and find that middle ground. Yeah, you know. But like, like that's why I like stores like you guys because you're supporting the companies that are supporting open source, like the Duet guys and the E3D guys, you know, the people that are innovating in the industry and releasing their source so other people can benefit from it, um, and, and promoting all all of those people. I, I really, really appreciate that. Because yeah, it would be a lot easier if I was just selling cheap crap. It really would. <laughs> <laughs> but i couldn't sleep at night uh i come from an open source background i come from that history of that um way back in the day i used to work for a, a fairly large uh, i can't say their name publicly but a fairly large video game manufacturer and uh i uh, worked in their tools and technology devil- uh, division which our job was to acquire intellectual property for game developers and to test it out um, okay. I was the only guy in my department that didn't have a PhD um, at the time, but uh, I spent a lot of my time with legal departments and open source licensing to ensure that we were in compliance and that we used it. And this was back, you know, 98, 99. And I got to tell you that that's what really got me hooked on open source was every single time I sat down with the lawyers and I sat down with the creators. I was going, this is gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And th- this company, they were just like, well, how much does it cost us for the rights to that? And I'd sit there and say, technically nothing. And they'd say, okay, well, how do we keep them going? And I loved that approach so much better. Oh, that yeah. I, you know, yeah. how do we keep them going? And I went, just give them money. The more you give them, the more they go. Yeah. Uh, you're not paying for a product. You're paying for more development. And yes. I really loved that. And that just stuck to me. Yeah. I have a quick random question on that. So did they have any issues with uh, the open licenses themselves? Because um, uh, where I work now, we use a lot of open source technologies, but we always have to run it by legal and they're always super. Mm-hmm. They feel like it's super sketchy, you know, but yeah. really not. Everybody else uses it with no problems. But how, did you guys run into any issues with uh, legal being all iffy about on, on, on open licenses? Well, that was my thing. That's what I was dealing with was that I was the technical translator for the lawyers. So I had to sit down with the lawyers. I went to so many meetings and lunches and would tell the lawyers, here's how it works. Here's what you've got. And just nitpick through every piece of paperwork. 
Yeah. Um, and the company was very supportive of that. So I was very happy. Um, it, it, I mean, they actually got, you know, agreements with like Red Hat and SourceForge and a lot of the, you know, separate companies back then, um, which was great. Yeah. And it wasn't even an agreement because they just like, we know we just got to release the source back, but they wanted additional agreements on top of that just yeah. to let them know that we are contributing and don't stop. And that's that a just really locked awesome in. approach. Like, you know, the, the fact that you guys were contributing and, and being openly supportive is I, I work for the same company that Aaron does now. And we, as a group, brought on the first open source robotics program that uh, that company had dealt with. And I think we spent a year with legal nitpicking GPL licensing and Creative Commons licensing and trying to understand how we could use all of those works and stay in compliance and not have to release the proprietary things that we were trying to do or right. um, feel like that they had to. Because the understanding that my supervisors at the time had was like, well, if we use anything with open source, we have to release everything that we do with open source. And that is completely against how we want to do everything because we want to patent everything. And it was like, it, it took a very long time to get it through their heads that, no, based on this license that we're using, we only have to release things that we contribute to the core code. Any proprietary things that we're doing we can keep for ourselves if we need to, or we can release them back if you feel that that is acceptable. And exactly. I mean, it was great. And yeah, my division, our, jo our job was to, it was a game platform, and our job was to get out, or my, my specific job was to go get other game to video game developers and say, I have this code for you to use in your games for our platform. And oh, go. nice. So it was my job to kind of go out there and sell it. And the success of my job was how many games on the market were using my product or my my license pool that I was working with. Okay. So things like that. Um, and it, it was, I mean, that's, it's sort of open source while still, you know, technically putting money in everybody's pockets. It's kind yeah. of what it was. And uh, that definitely got me on a dirt crunching hippie uh, open source uh, platform, as I like to call it. Where, you know, then I hear open source hardware and I'm like, oh my God. And, <laughs> you know, back when the patents expired on 3D printing, I'm sitting there in the uh, makerspace up in San Francisco and we're all sitting around the table, like counting down until it expires. And we're like, yes, okay, here we go. <laughs> um, and go. <laughs> it, it was that, and go and post the files. Go. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, man. Nice. To be oh. a fly on the wall in that room. It was it was it was a lot of fun, and that's exactly what I was at the time. I was a fly on the wall because I spent most of my time with back then with lawyers and you know media and entertainment companies. But you know, secretly at night, I'd go home and build my own stuff. So, what do you think will be the next thing like that? The next thing where we're waiting for the patent to expire, and the open source community is just going to go and go. And we're just going to disrupt everything with you. Hey, I've been waiting for it. Healthcare. Oh, God. That, that, that's what I was going to say is healthcare. <laughs> uh, there, pa well, we see this now with generic drugs. That We can kind of almost use that as, you know, the open source is really generic drugs. After the patents expire on that, it, we see it immediately go to the public. And we see the costs drop out the bottom. We see a bunch of companies release it. And we see a lot of innovation in the product in in the the medicine field and that's just the benefit of uh patents expiring yeah um that's the benefit of open source or patents expiring either one of those dies off and you know the world gets becomes a better place yeah um, 3d printing we're, we're definitely getting into a golden age here because with 3d printing over the next five years we've got like 20 some odd patents that are all going to expire all nearly at the same time you know, we're Which ones? <laughs> well, we're starting to see um, heated build chambers or uh, the patents are going to expire on that relatively soon. We're seeing uh, a lot of SLS. S, um, SLS is going to expire here relatively uh. soon. Um, we're getting a lot of that. I knew that um, one was coming. You know, we're, we're, we're about what? I think we're almost 10 years off from the true 
automated belt printing solutions uh, expiring. Uh, so that'll be nice too. Yeah. So, um, as well as a lot of the slicing profiles that you know the, the Cura uh, has to get around. We're going to see a lot of new slicing oh. profiles coming out, which is going to be great. Um, so I'm excited. I didn't realize that slicing was locked up in IP, but I I guess that makes perfect sense. You know, they were some of the original ones. So I mean, Cura and most of those guys, they had to you know develop their own slicing from, almost from scratch. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot of improvement there. Well, and like we beat up on Pathio a lot on the show, not. I guess promote Pathio, but you know they're digging into slicing from scratch with that, and I think that's almost been a benefit is you're taking ten years of knowledge and then taking that back to roots and understanding it better. It's like I've used closed source slicing software for the big printers, and it's painful. It's downright painful. I don't know that it's better. Well, it's different. And it had it to is. potentially be different. And that's what we're facing. And that's once all, all those patents expire and slicing becomes truly open source. I think my dog's excited to be on the podcast here. <laughs> um, is that Jesse? But once, that's Jesse. Ah. <laughs> so, but um, once we see those patents expire on uh, the slicing stuff, all of those ideas can get rolled into you know, what Pathios is doing, what even Cura mm-hmm. is doing to some degree. We're going to get a lot of advantages there. So. <laughs> she's she's, just she's so happy. So. But, um, yeah, you know, we uh, we do our uh, open source filament, the Jesse filament, which was named after my dog. Yeah. And the only reason why I called it Jesse filament is because there's too many filaments out there that have pro extreme build titan you know some <laughs> technical mighty name behind it and i said yeah. i'm just gonna go with the beer brewer name concept just pick something stupid off the wall and call it that and i look down and there's my stupid dog sitting at my feet and i go perfect there we go <laughs> if you guys release an open source petg or an open source nylon i vote that you name it the ripley because <laughs> My dog's a tough little badass, and and she just needs a filament named after her. <laughs> I, I I think you might be on to something there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to just start naming different filament lines after uh, random dogs of other makers. I like that. Yeah, that's the, that is exactly how you should do it. So, why did you guys put out your own filament? Well, every company kind of has one. And we started off with a filament called our daily filament. And we were like, well, our first requirements, we want it to be a good filament. We want it made in the USA. We want it to be that type of company, you know, that type of filament mm-hmm. line. And daily was a good filament. But the problem was is that um, they, were, they weren't they were winding it properly. Um, you know, it wasn't bad. Oh. I mean, it's just they weren't winding it as well as I wanted it to be wound. It was that factory with all those factory kinks and knots that everyone on Facebook's always complaining about, huh? Exactly. <laughs> so they, they actually they, they just wound it too tight um, on the spools, and okay. they wouldn't adjust their settings for us. So okay. Um, so I found IC3D, mm-hmm. and I've been chatting with those, and they're open source guys. And I went, I don't care. They're it. They're the guys I want to do it with. I'll just tell me the price, and we'll figure it out. Uh, <laughs> I, I've been using them since the very first Murph, and they make great stuff. Yeah, oh, go on. The fact Sorry. that they were willing to, you know, white box it for us, as it, as it's called, I went, that's awesome. And I said, well, there's two catches to white boxing with you guys. One is that I need to make sure everybody knows that you are the ones making it for us. And two, I need to make sure I have a writer that I can use your same open source license. Okay. Those are my two requirements. The first one was just because you'd be surprised how many filaments out there are white labeled. There is not that many manufacturers of filaments in the world. And I a vast majority of them are white labeled. You get like maybe two hands worth of fil- filament manufacturers? You, you might need a third. You might need a third if you want to get into some of the technical people. Yeah. Um. And uh, I got to discover that with uh, MakerBox. 
Uh, if you know, we we bought MakerBox a while back. Um, yeah. Recently, with uh, Matt departing from Printed Solid, he took MakerBox with him. But um, you know, working with MakerBox, I started to go. These are all starting to look a lot familiar, and I seem to be getting them all from the same place. Wait a minute. And you start looking into it, and you realize that there's really not a lot of people, different people manufacturing. So every right. time a new extrusion line pops up, you just kind of pop your head up and go, ooh, new guy. <laughs> yeah. What new you good know. stuff do you make? Exactly. And it's not uncommon for a manufacturer to – or if you see a white label, they literally get their own spools made. And then they have the manufacturer spin it on there, and you think it's like a whole new product, and it's really just the same filament on a clear spool this time or a spool with a hole on the side. Um, things <laughs> like that. Yeah, and like, and not to downplay some of the white label guys, because like, a couple of them do really good jobs specifying the filaments that they want, and they have really good stuff made. Um, but... I, I like the fact that like IC3D, they made their own line. Like they actually designed their own extrusion line. They designed their own precision winders. I spent two years of my life designing precision winders. I can appreciate what they went through. You know, between so, IC3D and Protopasa, those two guys have some of the best lines out there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited that Protopasa is coming to Earth. Yes. With uh, they're bringing the entire extrusion line, so you can see it. Speaking of Earth, they're bringing a special extrusion line. They're making a new portable extrusion line. Oh, what? so I didn't know that. So they're making their own little portable extrusion line, which is going to be pretty awesome. That's dope. I'm so excited for Earth this year. So yeah. they're, they're actually able to load it on trucks because you, you know you know moving an extrusion line is not an easy process. Most no extrusion way. lines are three phase power. They're at least sixty foot long. Um, and require fairly large, you know, water baths usually, um, for them and, you know, 10 foot tall and, you know, require days upon days just to set up because they're technically all a bunch of separate machines. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone thinks so. extrusion line and they think of like, um, like fill extruders, like the, the <laughs> bench top drill auger things. And it's like just bigger. Yeah. Just, it's just bigger. And it's like, <laughs> no. It's no. not that at all. If you actually dig into it, uh, if you if you're building your own extrusion line, you're going to buy about twelve different pieces of equipment, and you have to get them all in sync and set up. And that's really what makes all the different plants so unique. Yes, is is the even the building an extrusion line in will affect the quality of the extrusion line of the filament coming off the end. Totally. So. Yeah, your your humidity, your ambient temperature, your wind flow, like your air movement, like all of that will affect all of that. Who and, you hired that week? Yes. Uh, the, if, the they had, if, if they had it, a bad put a day. Lot to it. If they had a bad day, <laughs> if Tommy recently got divorced, there's going to be problems. You know, your tolerances are going to slip a little bit. <laughs> hey, you know. this, the stuff that I was doing when I was winding... Uh, yeah, it, it was textiles, so it was pretty consistent. Like, the speed of my winder changing wouldn't affect my end product that much. But with a plastic, the speed of the winder changing, that'll change your diameter. That'll change so much. That would be, that would be so detrimental to your process. Like, there's so many steps that have to be monitored for an extrusion line. It just because it'd be more pull on the yeah the plastic or less faster. Well, you can have a puller that'll regulate that with a take up, but the catch is is that uh, when you're dealing with an extrusion line, the winding has to be perfect, and the tolerance is coming out of it before the puller is amazing. Um, most of the time, you go through a water bath or an air bath or anything like that just to get it cooled so it'll maintain not only the ovality but also the diameter in the filament. Yeah. And those are values you have to watch very closely right down the spooling. And even in the tax, uh, textiles, um, yeah. our first uh, filament, the daily filament, was made at a textile manufacturer. And uh, their tolerances were okay. But when you're talking filament, I mean, right now people hate anything that's, you know, 0.05. Uh, they yeah. all want 0.02 or, or less. And that's really hard to do. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. 
<laughs> yeah, you're you know. you're talking laser profilometers at multiple stages to make sure that's all good and 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 I, I love with the the laser uh, the laser profiles is that people are starting to you know buy four and six you know profiles. I'm sitting there going, it's a circle, two's enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, any, any more than that, and you're just showing off. But um, the other curse that a lot of these extrusion lines are running into is that a speed. A really good, nice, high-end line right now is going to get uh, 50 kilograms an hour off of it, which is pretty impressive. That's 50 spools an hour you, you know, you're getting at home. But the faster you run, the worse your ovality, the worse your diameter variances are going to get. Yeah. So companies, to get filament off faster and get it cheaper, run it at the 50. You want to keep good tolerances, you're going to be bumping down, you know, 30, 20, 10. Yes. And you can literally see money going out the door. So it's really tough for a manufacturer to justify, you know, 0.02 to a 0.05 and go, well, I can make five times as much of that. So uh, we're sticking to 50. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why you see the really high end filament manufacturers. You know, they're still staying at like 30 to $40 a kilogram because they want to keep that your really precise um dimensions and, and tolerances but you know, that's also why i know that like if i buy something from like say filamentum um you know two two rolls that i bought two months apart they're going to be dead on most likely because they really really care about that you know and that's important that's what you find is the smaller manufacturers tend to be more worried about consistency. Yeah. Um, you, you get filamentum, they're doing a pretty good job. You're getting a color fab who, even with their growth, has still managed to maintain their tolerances and their quality control. Yes. Um, I give them big credit for that. But you're seeing a lot of other manufacturers that as they ramp up, they just, you know, they're chasing the dollar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 part, the problem with that is, is that with today, we're seeing a lot of MMUs. We're seeing a lot of multi-filament systems and stuff like that. And diameter is becoming more and more important on a regular basis. Yes. I mean, 0.75 to 0.73 can affect an MMU. I mean, it can affect a palette. It can affect, yeah. you know, the quality of your print layers. I mean, we're, we're actually finally getting to that point where it actually matters. Yes. Yeah, the palette really has a panic if you don't have two things that are almost dead nuts the same diameter. It really doesn't like it. <laughs> and the Prusa MMU uh, 2 is even worse. I, I, I have yet to use that. Uh, but, you know, that's why I like my tool changer, because I have a 3 mil and a 1.57 mil sitting right next to each other, and they don't care. <laughs> you can be very forgiving on a tool changer configuration. Yes. I think that's one of their key advantages is that with a tool changer configuration, you're going to see um, different tools, ironically enough. Yeah. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't no think that with a name like a tool. <laughs> it's crazy talk. <laughs> but doing a 175 and a 3 millimeter filament and a 285 millimeter filament all at the same time and having their tolerances, you know, slop all over the place, you're still going to get pretty darn good prints out of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was my tool changer at Murph was the only one running a two eight five. I think it's the only one in the world running two eight five still. And uh, you know, I, I threw it on there because I have tubs of two eight five filament. So I figured, why not? <laughs> I want to be able to use whatever tires. I want. By the way, since it's a podcast and we can say this, you know, two eight five or one seven five, I will go ahead and say it. I like 285 filament. <gasps> what? I like it a lot. I'd like the to hug you right now. It's why, got, why it, do you like it's it? It's got its uses, man. Well, it's got its uses. I, I love how everyone tries to look for, you know, extremely technical reasons. It gets higher flow rates, yada, 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 BS, 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 BS. It comes down to a, a very simple thing. You can have extremely lax tolerances, and it's still pretty good. I mean, 10% of 285 is far less than 10% of 175. Right. Um, but the other thing is, is that you rarely ever hear about someone complaining about their 285 filament getting tangled or they lose the end or it snaps off while it's extruding. Yep. It's That's the simplest reason right there. 
And that's why I like 285. I just think it's an easier filament to work with getting it on the machine. As far as print quality, arguably it's hard to tell the difference. You you can't. You really can't. With modern extrusion systems, you really can't. The big thing that I like about it is um, it's a thicker noodle to shove. So when you get into soft durometer flexibles or anything like that, it's just a way easier to deal with. The only thing I don't like about it is trying to do anything with like a Bowden tube or anything where you have a complicated filament path like uh, the BCN Sigmas. Um, that gets difficult just because it's it's so much stiffer. It's high friction for the path. Yeah. And, and that's why now you got remote Bowdens. So well, not a problem anymore. You can do remote Bowdens or, you know, like for my tool changer, I went to two direct drive extruders for my 285s instead of Bowden extruders. And I just hang the filament above the printer and that problem solved. It's a super simple engineering problem to solve. And now I have the reliability of three millimeter flexibles and nylons. And it's also way harder to strip out three millimeter. There's a lot more meat to strip out. There's a lot more noodle. Yeah. Which, by the way, I will say this. My greatest cheat sheet trick in the world was filaments. To know if it's a decent enough filament or not. So I usually go on their website and they offer a 285 and a 175. I know they're trying and they actually know what they're doing. That's one of my, that's my, that's like my first test. If I look on there and I go, oh, we only do 175, I go, all right, well, you're crap and yeah. move on. So even if I, even if I need just 175, I sit there and I go, you guys aren't taking care of your line. You aren't watching your product. I, I kind of agree with that. There's a couple of companies that I deal with that only run 175 and it makes me sad every time I have to buy from them and I can't get it for all my printers. I can only get it for the one. For the selection. Yeah. And I, I tend to find that the quality tends to dip a little bit more. But okay. when when a 285 and a 175, especially on an extrusion line, if you've ever swapped out between a 175 and a 285 die, you're pretty much overhauling the machine between the swap out, which means that they're paying attention to the machine care. That would make sense. Yeah, I would totally, I could totally see that. So you talk to any of the extrusion people at IC3D and they'll sit there and go, we run 285 on, you know, this day and this day and 175 on this day. Huh. And it's because the overhaul of the machine is a pain in the butt. Yeah. You know, it's not just change the nozzle on the front. Right. Yeah, I imagine they're probably changing the augers. They're probably changing the speeds that their uh, winders are running, which may change if they're using a cam system for their idlers for their. Yeah, there's a lot of things they'd change. Yeah, I mean, the pull, the take up reels, the whole nine yards, the spoolers, all of that has to be recalibrated when you switch between the two. Most of the time, they don't switch augers. Most of the time, auger switching is just material. Yeah. It is when they have to swap between materials. But, um, yeah, if you change diameters on your filaments, you're going to change a lot in the line just to get it just right. Huh. So, David, while we have you here, I heard there are white knight kits coming. Yes, yes. Um, we, uh, I've been working on the white knight. Um, trying my best. Carl, I love him. He made an amazing printer. Right now, what I'm doing is I'm going back through his files and all of his hardware. And I'm trying to make it kittable. Um, Because the way he designed his printer, he made it a beautiful printer. And he was able to build it. But we have to think about kits. And people printing the parts. How do we make it the most successful? Um, So that's currently what I'm going through. Which means I'm going to have to kind of redesign a lot of his parts. And think about the machining of individual parts. And things like that. All the way down to the nozzle. Um, he literally has to grind down nozzles. Yeah, he puts mm-hmm. it on his printer. And yeah. kudos to him, but the average person who's going to build the printer is not going to be sitting there grinding down nozzles. Nope. Uh, on a regular what? basis. I know, crazy. So <laughs> lazy um, I have makers. To kind of look at that. I know. I have to look at that. I have to look at the wiring harnesses. Um, even the extrusion profile choices he made. While they're great, I have to think about them from a kit format and Mm. get reliable machine houses that can actually replicate it on a regular basis. 
Interesting. Because we have successfully about half a dozen white knights out there. And if I launch it, you know, we're going to have a couple hundred probably within the first week or two. Yeah. And I would hate for a couple hundred kits to go out and only 10 of those people to actually have a functioning printer by the time they're done. Right. Yeah. So. I, I definitely understand that. Wait, with the kits that I put together, you know, there were 15 that went out and I think three of them function. Um you know, those were, and, and that was like a small kit that was pretty well thought out. It was a pretty simple printer. Um, Carl's printer is not simple. It, so, it, it's, it's not a simple build. It's a simple concept. It's just not a simple build. No. And he picks some amazing components. Yeah. And I think he's, he's got some really smart ideas in there. They just need to be set up. Um, an example that I like to say is that right now he, um, he has a linear rails run in for the X and Y configuration. But what he's doing is he has a linear rails tapped to the center of the extrusion. So that the frame is all perfectly, you know, centered and squared, which is perfectly fine. If you're an engineer building a one-off product, that makes sense. Yeah. But an end, an end user, you don't want to tap into center extrusion with a bottom out hole. That's empty. No, too many people will over tighten and stripping it out. So I'm having to revisit that extrusion concept and see if offset in it or if I need to get a custom profile made um, for that oh. so that it actually taps correctly. He um, tapped the extrusion? He tapped the extrusion, but he tapped through oh the center gosh. beam, which, if you know what you're doing, is great. Yeah. But I've seen way too many people put together an E3D hot end or a Bontech extruder to realize that they will rip out threads like nobody's business. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Everyone's like, oh, it's tight. I'm going to give it another three-quarter turn. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fine. I didn't realize that. I, or, they, or they sit there and go, i got to put 20 bolts in. I'm going to load the Allen wrench up into the drill and go to yeah. town. Oof. You no. Know, you, you have to think about that because you, you do have to think about – the other side of it is, is that this is a kit printer, and I expect a lot of people to mod it. So that means that a lot of people are going to take this apart, put it together, take it apart, put it together, change things on it, yes. stuff like that. And it needs to survive the multiple teardowns and put together. It's not just be put together once. Yeah. 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 I, like I see your rail core behind you and I know you're an active member of the rail core community. I, I really think you can take that community as a good example of what you'll probably see from like a white knight community of people constantly modding constantly sharing new files and new ideas new teardowns new builds i mean if you look at my rail core i'd probably say that i did about 10 15 mods on that mm -hmm. and of course i posted all the files up for everybody and talked with all the guys about it and all that stuff and um i could see white knight taking that as much as well yeah and i have to prep that machine for that rail core has some you know really great company like 713 makers out there he keeps making new parts that are just completely different from the design, but it makes the printer 10 times better yes. each time. Everything, every little thing he did. Um, and I think it's brilliant. And I think that's, that's, that's the type of thing I want for the white knight. Yeah. And did, did you end up your like, yeah. kit through project R3D? Well, no, since I am a true maker, I of course had to source everything myself Tap everything oh, no. myself, cut everything. Um, I laser cut all the panels myself, and you know, I, I did it all from scratch. So, Project R3D, that. great guys, <laughs> but no, if, if I'm going to make something, I want to I want to do it the hardest way possible. Um, that's my mentality. Yes, um, man after my own heart. Yep, me too. <laughs> me <laughs> me too. Just take the easy way out. <laughs> you know, why why spend twenty dollars and get something when you can spend a, a two hundred dollars and make it yourself? Or five thousand dollars, and at the end you have a new tool. <laughs> yeah, somehow I ended up with the company printed solid because I started doing things that way. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my my favorite example is that um, I've been huge in laser cutters, um, going way, way, dear God, way back. I think my first laser cutter was back in like two thousand seven, two thousand six. Okay. Um. And uh, I, I've been making enclosures for 3D printers for that long. And when I started getting really a lot of work for it, I needed another laser cutter. 
The house I was living in had standard doors, but I needed a laser cutter that was three foot by four foot in size, which means the actual machine was about six foot by 10 foot by five foot tall, which means it wouldn't fit through any door. So I decided to, instead of buying the super cheap machine and throwing it at my house, I spent you know about twice as much and built it inside the house. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then when I moved, I, I had done. to take it apart. <laughs> but you knew how it went together again, so because you built it. Exactly. Benefit. And and I'll tell you right now is that um, if you look at the laser cutters like I have at Printed Solid, I used to make our stuff with. Uh, one I found literally in a trailer in northern Pennsylvania. Um, the guy bought it at auction, never could get it to run. And all I did was just gut it and make it my own because it had a great steel frame. I look and, for those deals every day. I never find them. <laughs> oh, God. I, I found an amazing deal, and I was so pissed I couldn't land it. Someone had a welding robot for $1,100 down in Baltimore, and I drove down there like banging on their door going, I got cash. <laughs> I don't care. Just give it to me. <laughs> I was ready to load it up in the back of a truck and get going. I, I had no idea what I was going to use it for, but I'm like, a six-axis welding robot. Hell yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know. But, um, like, the other fun was, like, the lasers, is that if you look on eBay, you'll find these cheap Chinese piece of crap, three-foot by four-foot laser cutters that um, barely work for a week, but they're like $2,500. They're great. As soon as you cut them out, take the entire gantry out, remove all the electronics, throw the laser tube away and the power supply, and rewire the whole thing, and then lift the top up about six inches, great. Great machine. Um, <laughs> I don't think it takes that much work. I, I'm a big fan of cheap Chinese lasers once they're recontrolled. <laughs> but go ahead. <laughs> you know, well, think about this way. We're, we're running our lasers, you know, eight hours a day solid. Mm -hmm. So totally. they... They fell, they fell apart within the first month. Yeah. And I was like, okay, I got my month out of it. Perfect. And gut it. And the reason why is because it was cheaper to buy that laser than it was to build a metal box that big. Yes. 100% yes. So I bought all of that and threw away the rest of it because it was cheaper just to buy the metal box and then work from there. So what's your favorite brand of laser tube? Dear Lord. Um, <laughs> I'm still... <laughs> I've jumped around quite a bit, but... I'm still kind of an SPT fan. I have not gotten really? onto the. I'm not a Recti fan, um, okay. and the main reason why is I think Rectis are good. They work out, but I haven't seen a performance increase over an SPT tube if you get a decent, you know, power supply for it. Okay. And I know I know a lot of people are listening now are like, "What the hell is he talking about?" It's well, just like yeah, it's just preferential. I'm barely things. hanging on. I I've been building lasers for. Uh, six years now and i've gone through tubes like crazy uh, i haven't had an spt yet my last one um crap i have a recce now and i'm a big fan and um that's been the last three tubes i've bought for the last three lasers i've bought um the the one that i had it was in the same class as SPT, but it died in six months, and I was really upset about that because it was expensive. And I'm gonna the, the, look the it up. Yeah, the, the secret is the over you know over chill everything on a laser. Yeah, go beyond well beyond specs. Five thousand uh, chillers are crap. Get yourself at least a fifty six hundred every single time. Um, Eight hundred watts or more on chilling power, bare minimum. And ignore everything you've ever read about what's the right thing to put into it. Don't put antifreeze. Don't put bleach. Don't put silver nitrate. None, all that crap is stupid. Distilled water. Yeah, we've moved to distilled okay. water. We're running bleach in ours at the makerspace right now, and I'm just running straight distilled water in mine. If you feel the need for bleach, literally less than a cap full is all you add to yeah. every gallon. Oh, what we found was. Um, we we are now having brown algae grow in our lines because the bleach is degraded. So uh, I'm reading that isopropyl is a good idea if the bleach is degrading or a commer commercial um, aquarium algicide, yep. just like a, a straight algicide from like um, 
that you'd buy at the pet store is a good idea. Just run it through and clean it for 24 hours and then go back to distilled water. Yeah, this is just adding to the distilled water. So, because the reason why is because anytime you put an antifreeze, you put a bleach, you put isopropyl in there, you put an algae, uh, alginate in there, you're taking away the thermal value of right. distilled water. Uh, that's why it kills me every time I see somebody put an antifreeze in there. I'm like, you do realize that that's meant not to get cold. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's why I've just been like, don't get fancy about it. Just clean your machine at least once a year. We've had our water in for about a year now. So maybe it's we time. just need to change our water. Well, we, we moved in October. Okay. Well, maybe we need to change our water more. The problem is our our water tubes are right by a window, which is not good. So the laser tube yeah. that I had die in less than a year was an ERF F4. And okay. I, I had high hopes for that tube because it's rated at 120 watts max. Um, for about the same price as the 100 watt uh, recce tube, but the recce tubes lasted about four years for me now. So, well, you also run just the sheer luck of the draw. Mm hmm. The sheer yes. luck of the draw depends on how they manufacture the tube for that week. Yes. And here's the other thing every tube I get, I check the diameter of the beam, but I try to check the diameter of the beam at extremely long distances, like 30, 40 feet. Oh, wow. So you're just shooting bare oh. beams into your factory for funsies, right? <laughs> just across the room, just to see. And then I measure the beam at the other side of the room. Not a big deal. Yeah. Um, you just you just take off the side of the, the, the cutter and you take the mirror out and you just shoot it off to the other side of the room and measure the diameter. Because if the diameter stays the same, you're going to have a much more powerful beam that's going to last a lot longer. They actually focus the mirror correctly right. inside the tube. We go through about three to four tubes a year on average at Printed Solid. Oh, wow. Okay. Because we're, we're running three cutters at least eight hours a day. Okay. That'll do it. And it's not it's, it's not off and on. It's literally the guy sitting there waiting immediately to the job is, loads the next sheet on. Job is, load the next sheet on. So are you guys ordering direct from China then? Or are you do you have a U.S. supplier for tubes? Uh, we I use a U.S. supplier for tubes, and the reason why is the the same reason that I just don't like ordering direct from China unless I actually know the people there is companies like Light Objects out of uh, Sa uh, Sacramento. Yeah. I pay a fortune in shipping, but I know that they've pulled every tube out. They've checked the power. They've checked the diameter for me before they ship it to me. Yes. And they made sure it didn't get broken on its way to me. Yeah. Um. So their tubes have always been great. Um. Cam 5 out of Florida does a pretty good job from time to time um on their part so i'm good with those guys um but i i always fall back to light objects mainly because they're kind of like me they carry all the individual components as well yes mm -hmm. yeah i i buy a lot of things from light object for tubes we've been going through automation technology in chicago mostly because i can drive up there and get the tube and uh they let me shoot it in the factory and check it when i get there which is fun. Those are good guys. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have as wide of the selection of the little junk. Yes. But they're, they're good guys. Yeah. You know, they're three hours away. I can just go get the tube. Go get some Chicago style pizza while I'm there. By the way, can I tell you a disappointment? Uh, you mentioned Chicago style pizza, which I love. I flew through Chicago O'Hare recently. I was so disappointed that the one piece of joint in there says Chicago style pizza. And you walk in there and it's freaking thin crust. Yeah. <laughs> it's so disappointing. <laughs> and then I had a bunch of Chicago people tell me, oh, no, that's Chicago style. And I'm like, no, no, stop. <laughs> that's really O'Hare in a nutshell. It's just a giant disappointment most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. I would yeah, agree. It's really just the precursor to Illinois as a whole. Uh, I don't know. We're pretty cool. RCL is pretty cool. So is there anything... That you're doing at Print Solid that you're like super excited about? Any products that you're ready to carry or that you're carrying? Anything that like just like you really want to share with the world? Well, I mean, besides the White Knight, which I'm excited about, it's it's a fun project. Um, I ha I have the unfortunate curse that you know since Matt has left me, I have to spend more time doing that annoying business accounting back end, you know, <laughs> logistical crap that sucks donkey. 
uh, is probably the easiest way to phrase it. Yeah. Um, so the White Knight is right now my my main glimmer of hope, as it were, uh, for a true like hacking modding project. Um, other things I'm working on is uh, I've been you know I, I'm getting new toys in. I recently got a you know nice giant vacuum former that I'm trying to do some uh, shape developments for, and I'm trying to figure out new enclosure designs um, to work with. Um, I have a, a company out of Germany that I've been talking with and trying to develop um, enclosure heating elements, which I am going to be really excited if I can get that Ooh. to market. Oh, nice. Yeah. Mm. Mainly because I'm trying to treat, if I get that product properly launched, um, I'll have the ULCE certifications and all that stuff. And I'll feel safe enough with people heating their enclosures that it won't burn down their house. Right. Right. Nice. That's so, important. Yeah. So I'm like, trying to get that to market, um, which is going to be really cool because that, that's going to be a good maker thing uh, for a lot of people because we're starting to see a lot of more high temp stuff. And people yeah. were finally starting to need heated build chambers. Yes. Yeah. We could finally run extruders at like 600 degrees reliably. I want to run PEI and PPSF and all the weird stuff. Yeah. Give me an enclosure here. Come on. You know, and <laughs> by the way, I, I've told, uh, and I'm just going to completely backstep and sidestep because why the hell not? But enclosures, my little spiel on them, and I love telling this to people. This is my general rules uh, for enclosures on 3D printers. If your material prints at 235C or less, you don't need an enclosure unless you're trying to keep your cat out of the machine. If you're trying to print anything below uh, 265 or 270 or less, you don't need a heated build chamber. You just need to prevent drafts, right? Uh, temperature differentials. As soon as you get above 280, 290, 300, then you need a heated build chamber. I would agree with that. Based on my experience, yeah, I would totally agree with all of that. Because... And I, I, I love to give that advice out to everybody in the world because you read anywhere on Facebook or forums and all that stuff. Everybody tries to treat every material and filament like it's got some special rules uh, with enclosures or heating and all that stuff. 235 or less, screw it. Don't put anything over it. Yeah. You know, 265, 270. All right, stop drafts. Anything above that? Okay, now we're talking heated chambers. Yeah. And I, I, I always try to bring that up because – I see way too many people that take their Perusa and shove it into a box, seal off every single corner, <laughs> and then put a space heater in the back corner and then try and print ABS in it and then come back and wonder why their printer's melted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that's probably my biggest speech spiel that I tend to give out to people when it comes to enclosures. Well, I mean, like... <laughs> People want to say that you have to print nylon in an enclosure and print ABS in an enclosure. And like, for the longest time, I was printing huge parts in nylon in open air. You know, just I had my parameters set right. I had a part that was well designed for 3D printing and I had dry filament and nylon prints great. Well, I will say this. You, you know, we manufacture these really nice enclosures. You know, they, they go up like $350. Well, every single one of my enclosures, if you're printing with nylon or ABS, could be completely replaced with a cardboard box from Lowe's. You'll get just as good a quality. You heard it here. And I say, <laughs> I say it, I say it with all honesty that a cardboard box will do a really good job. Yeah. If you're going to do it repeatedly and you need something stable, then sure, buy my enclosures. But if you're doing a one-off, if you're testing, you're trying stuff out, cardboard box, photo tent, whatever is good enough. Yeah. Dave built In fact, beautiful you, control or enclosures, beautiful enclosures. That I try really hard. I, I try to actually make my enclosures. My, my my favorite thing I like to tell people is that my enclosures are meant to leak. Um, they actually have openings on them and and gaps on them because in addition to be able to print the ABS and the nylons and all that stuff, there's always the vast majority of printing is still going to be PLA. Yes. So you need to let some heat out or you're going to get heat creep. You're going to get jams. You're going to get things like that. Yeah. Because every printer that doesn't have an enclosure, they tested it and they configured it for open air printing. Yeah. So you have to kind of do your compromise and realize the difference between those. Well, it's like um, I remember a few years ago, Dremel 
converted the Flash Forge Dreamer. And they put an enclosure around it, but then they made it PLA only because they took the heated bed out. And I was like, you just made a non-functional printer, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> well, MakerBot did the same thing. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> a, a lot of them did that because it was just safer and cheaper. Mm-hmm. Totally. I mean, every, every fire we hear about is because of the heated bed almost every time. Yeah. It's almost always the wiring on the heated bed. Bad MOSFETs. And so, yeah. Well, not even that. The wiring to the bed. It's, oh, it's yeah. The, it, it, the wiring moves the most, and that's the problem you have to watch out for. A vast majority of them aren't using silicone wiring. They aren't doing decent solder joints. And we are talking about a resistive load. Yeah. So that's why you're getting all these fires and stuff like that. That's why Anet doesn't sponsor our podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, can we say uh, I, I want to give a little bit of applaud um, to Anet for finally releasing Source. Yeah. See that. Yeah. Yeah. That was. Yes. Like, you know, golf clap. Good job, guys. We, we, Thanks. We can give them crap. I had a fire extinguisher sitting next to my booth at at Murph. <laughs> um, TH3D gave them fire extinguishers. Yes, that was amazing. Um, <laughs> it was the theme of Murph. But the fact that they released Source, I do want to applaud everybody involved with that. And I really think over the last, I, I don't want to take too much credit for it, but since uh, I stopped carrying Creality because of the open source licensing about a year and a half ago, I everyone has been starting to follow suit and we're starting to see companies like TH3 uh TH3D and Amy Woo all of them are really getting on that bandwagon and getting those compliances. Yeah. And I really love that that's where we've gone. Yes. Yeah, Tim and Naomi really beat up on them and that was uh Tim from TH3D and Naomi from um uh sexy, sexy, cyborg. sexy cyborg. Yes. Gosh. Anyway, so, two beers deep. They, they, they all beat up, and they did a really good job on that. So, yeah, I mean, that was huge. They they definitely kept adding to that pile, and we're seeing a lot of the Chinese manufacturers actually falling in line. I, you know, I think it's really they're finally just starting to understand what it means. I, I don't, I don't think they're it's malicious. I just think they don't get it, and you know, they're finally getting the community behind it and getting the proper explanations made to their management and their companies and be like, oh, okay, you know, we need to do this. I, I think that, yeah, I think they're also seeing the value in it. Too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I'm really excited about that. I think that's going to be great for them. I mean, we're, we're starting to see that compliance, which means we're starting to see that Chinese, uh, China, you know, intellectual property, wall kind of fall a little bit. Yeah. It's making mm-hmm. things a little better. We're at the one hour mark. This is the last call. I just came up with this. <laughs> this is this is how we're gonna do this now. Yes, yeah, this is how we're gonna do it. It's the last call. Anything you guys want to share with our listeners before we call it? I'm good for tonight, but I definitely want you back, Dave. This was a really fun episode, and I feel like we have hours of things to talk about. I just want to beat up on you about lasers for a while. <laughs> we yeah, start a whole a separate fun. podcast about lasers. Yeah, exactly. We totally could. You know, if we're doing last call and we want to mention weird stuff, I have to give out one weird attribute about myself. All right. That is always entertainment for you. So, uh, I am probably one of the few makers in the 3D printing space that actually has a Guinness Book of World Record. Okay. I have a Guinness Book of World Record for building the world's largest uh, game controller. Interesting. So, oh. I, I built a four foot by eight foot Nintendo video game controller. And I say nice. this because, in all honesty, I think that was a pivotal turning point, which actually pushed me down the path of making making being a maker as a career. Um, I was working at a company called uh, Tech TV, uh, and then they transitioned over to G4 TV. Ah, okay. And, and nice. they had a show called Attack of the Show. I remember yes. that. Well, for yeah. For the longest time, I worked at that network. I was one of the chief engineers there. And I would go out drinking with the producers and the talent and the host pretty much every night. Um, so that's just kind of what we did. And we'd go over show ideas. 
and the little things they would do on the show and the hacks and the mods and stuff like that. And I kept helping them out with what behind the scenes and all of that. Well, one night in a drunken stupor, I said, hey, let's build the world's largest video game controller. This will be awesome. <laughs> and so we did. And I took my natural role of I sit there and I go and I tell the host, here's how I did it. Here's what you tell everyone. You know, go present it to the world. That type of thing. Right, right. Well, Guinness Book of World Record comes in there and I go, well, no. We need to know who actually built it. Yeah. And so they come back and they go, here's the guy that built it. So then they go on to the show and they say, well, David built it for us and here's how he built it type of thing. And then people on the show started asking, well, what's David working on now? What's he doing now? And stuff like that. So it kept me building and awesome. making and all that stuff. And it kept me going down that path. That's awesome. And that's that, super cool. That's my starting point. All right. So I know we're at the end of the show, but now I have like 10,000 questions. One, did the did the controller work? Yes. And not only did it work, but it had to plug into a, a standard NES <laughs> without modification. <laughs> Amazing. All right. <laughs> um, what was the controller made out of? Primarily MDF and uh, springs and parts for McMaster car. Man after my own heart. Uh, awesome. Did, was it painted to look like an NES controller? Yes, it was. Just enough that they couldn't, you know, sue me for putting the Nintendo logo on there. We changed it to the Attackers Show logo. Okay. Uh, <laughs> did it keep? But did it keep N scale? Nintendo asked to borrow it for a few events. Nice. That's even better. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. I love when you get support from the people that you copied. Hey, like, that means you did it really well. Hey, like, that's what you did it right. <laughs> yeah, they're not mad. They're excited, and they're like, "Can we be a part of this?" That's perfect. That's the best. Yeah, did, did it keep the same scale so all the buttons and, and printing and everything were the same? Everything was the perfectly the same scale. Um, it did require two people to operate because it was so big. So you do track and field, <laughs> and you'd have one person on the D-pad and one person slamming away on the A and B buttons really fast. Amazing. Amazing. Did you make a duck hunt gun to go with it? Yes, I did. Oh, oh wow. shit. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I did a duck hunt follow up on that where I took a uh, a uh, I took a, a replica of and this may be of poor taste but I took a replica of Lee Harvey Oswald's sniper rifle which was a bolt action Oof. and Oof. I put a couple of 555 circuits in there so that you had to reload it every time between shots and duck hunt oh my god and, <laughs> and use a scope good. and you could fire it from you know 30 feet away too good. I was joking. I did not expect you to answer yes for that. That's amazing. That that was way too on point. <laughs> my, my 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 favorite part about that one is that I convinced the producers to call it the snapper. Oh god, mm. that's so good. You're the worst. So good. I know. I cannot. <laughs> so for the sniper rifle, for the sniper zapper, and it was just the greatest pun in the world. I um. I literally. I can't wait to have you back on the show. Damn it. I know. You're coming back. Uh, always fun. So I, I, right. I always need a reason to drink while I'm on the internet. No, you don't. Don't we all? You don't need a reason. Nowadays. There's no reason to drink. It's just the internet exists. So to add to that a little bit, I don't personally have my own world record, but I have assisted with so many with a friend of the show, uh, April Jen Choi. Um, she holds multiple whip cracking records. And nice. I've, either been on the business end of the whip to be part of the record or helped her rig different staging, different video things to make. So I understand all the things that are put in place for Guinness. It's not easy to get a record. So congratulations. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. They're picky. Yeah, it was a big shop too. And I, I, they walk into my back office and I'm sitting there at my bench fixing a couple of ETRs and they're just like, so, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't have anything else to add. All right. If uh, any of you guys out there have any uh, stuff you want to hear us talk about or any questions for have an Dave? idea for guests or dead questions for Dave, anything else, uh, feel free to reach out to us at uh, Makers on Tap. Twitter. It? Our Twitter handle, Makers yeah. on Tap, or makersontap.com slash contact. Um, we are at makersontap at gmail.com. We want to hear what you, what you think. If you want to hear anything different, uh, please reach out to us. Hope you're enjoying the better audio sound with our new workflow. 
last week's episode sounded dope. Yeah. I'm excited to see how this one turns out. But with that. Keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast. Yes, please keep making stuff. We need more people doing that.